So what I'd like to do is talk about um, two of my favorite syndromes. You're never supposed to have a favorite syndrome, but these are two of my favorites. Uh, and that is um, new insights from prader willi and also Williams syndrome. The theme today that really will underlie many of my remarks is really that when we think about phenotypes, I think we have an incomplete story. We really have half the picture when we think about behavioral or developmental phenotypes. Um, and I, I likened it, I had this thought on the airplane out uh, this morning, that it's really not so much a half empty, half full glass scenario, but really thinking about phenotypes in terms of roads less traveled by and roads well traveled by. So to make this point very graphically, at the end of the academic school year, my little boys wanted to do something special to celebrate besides having cake, which we do every time school ends. And my thought was, ah, let's go to the park. Let's take a walk in the woods next to the bubbling brook. It'll be so relaxing and peaceful, the road less traveled by. The boys, however, wanted to go do something it, that was very well traveled by many school age children who were all out of school on the same day, and that is go to the go-karts. So you can see who won that battle, and go-karts we went. And that was the road definitely not less traveled by. Both have value, and both are important things to do. So the theme that you'll hear sort of back and forth throughout my remarks this afternoon is that let's indeed go to the go-karts where everyone else is and think about roads that are well-traveled when we think about phenotypes. But let's also think outside the box a bit in terms of roads or approaches that are less traveled. And so to do that, um, I would like to talk about two global areas. One has to do with families, and the second has to do with individuals with prader willi and Williams syndromes. And usually I end with families when I give a talk, but I've noticed the last several times I run out of time at the end, and families always get short shrift. So I thought, this time I'm going to put families first. So I want to talk a little bit about families and um, parents and family environment. And when you think about families, including the families that you work with in your clinical practice or your research program, I think the usual road in terms of how we think about families is, well, um, we need to provide families with a lot of education about Fragile X or autism or prader willi syndrome, help them with their advocacy skills, how to navigate those IEPs, how to better intervene with their children, how to support their kids' language development. And it's also, when we do research, who we need to get consent from. Okay? The other road that I think is much less travel by when we think about families of individuals that have disabilities is thinking about parents as adults and thinking about their adult development as humans and also ways of reducing their stress. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in just a minute. So families will be one area that we'll talk about this afternoon. And the second, obviously, will be individuals, individuals with prader willi and Williams syndromes. And again, I think the usual road, the way of looking at things is, you know, I'm a clinician by training. So obviously, I'm very interested in behavior problems and psychopathology, cognitive profiles. What are the underlying genetics and neurobiology that underpin some of these processes? And how do we think about those things over development? Those are the things that many of us in the room are very passionate about. The other road that I think is less traveled by is looking at neurocognitive strengths and talents, what I'm going to call character strengths and virtues in people with disabilities, their sense of accomplishment and, and engagement with the world and their meaning and purpose in life, and interventions that enhance um, well-being and actively enhance those traits. So when we get to the section on individuals, we'll talk about some recent um, data and findings and updates about the usual road, but I'm also going to share with you some findings about unusual things as well. So let's get started with families and environments. So when you talk with families that are raising a kid with, or, or an adult with autism or prader willi syndrome, you hear words like sad, I'm tired, I'm very grateful, I'm angry, I'm blessed, this child is a blessing in our life. Uh, this child has taught me patience. I'm more em empathic. We have a better sense of humor now. I feel guilty all the time. I'm touched. I feel chosen. I'm resentful of this kid, and I'm stressed up the yin-yang 
All of those things you'll hear from the same person or from different people over time. And probably the common denominator there is I'm stressed. Many parents say I'm really stressed. In fact, if you look at the literature as I have done, um, we know now for a fact, if you look at, these are just studies that were published over the last um, decade that have described high levels of family stress in kids and families that are raising children with disabilities. So um, Len Abadudo, who you'll get to know very well in the months ahead, um, all the way to Wheeler, uh, we've got studies in here that basically say, guess what? Families are stressed. Families are stressed, moms are stressed, dads are stressed. Every single one of those studies came to the conclusion that descriptively, hey, guess what? Families are stressed. And they use different measures, they use different populations. At the end of the day, the conclusion is compared to the general population, if you're raising a kid with a disability, you're stressed. And studies have looked at um, how does stress relate to coping styles, how does it relate to maternal or paternal health and mental health, what kind of diagnoses do they have, what, what, are, they, what are their anxiety and depression <coughs> symptoms, how does stress relate to economic status, and a very well-documented downward economic drift that we see in families of kids with disabilities that is very robust in this country and also abroad. People have looked at stress in relation to family demographics, divorce, marriage quality, age of the mother, adoptive parents, siblings, um, religiosity, and then in relation to diagnoses, um, how, are, how are families that are raising kids on the spectrum different from um, people that have kids with uh, specific syndromes, Smith McGinnis, Prader Willi, um, on and on and on. Another common denominator across all of these studies is that stress is robustly correlated and associated with behavior problems and psychopathology in the kids. So the more um, externalizing behaviors, tantrums, as well as internalizing behaviors like irritability, um, withdrawal, uh, sleep problems, self-injurious behaviors, all of these things are very strong <coughs> predictors of levels of stress in mom and dads. And that makes, it makes a lot of intuitive sense in terms of why that would be the case. Um, people are also increasingly looking at biomarkers of stress in parents of kids with disabilities. Marcia Seltzer, who I understand was here for this series um, some time ago, um, documented aberrant diurnal cortisol in, in moms. Uh, Gallagher looked at antibody response to uh, vaccinations and found a very poor response among mothers. And Elsa Apple, um, she's the telomere lady. Uh, she found greater oxidative stress and telomere shortening um, in a group of parents that were raising children with chronic medical issues as well as with developmental disabilities. So it was a mixed bag. And telomeres are those little tips on the ends of your chromosomes that um, are there as a protective shield of sorts, and they go through a normal um, aging process, and that aging process is accelerated in this study and in other studies as well. So I just wanted to mention that we are also doing um, a study looking at, descriptively, um, levels of stress in mothers and dads who are raising children with autism spectrum disorder and other types of developmental disabilities, we're collecting um, diurnal cortisol as well. Uh, at this point, we have 107 mothers whom we've collected court on, but we are also looking at a ton of mental health and medical and behavioral data and information about the child as well. And I don't know how many stats guys are in here, but um, we analyzed the cortisol in a somewhat different way. Essentially, what we did is um, something called growth curve mixture model clustering. And what that does, it's essentially a cluster analysis, but it sorts, instead of clustering cases together, it says, okay, let's look at these growth curves and cluster them together um, with no a priori designation about groups. We just said, we don't care. Uh, if this is a mom of a kid with autism or Prader-Willi syndrome, let's just look at the trajectories and see how they clump together and then go back and map onto those trajectories what we know about the families, about the moms. And it was a very, for me, it was a very interesting approach. It's very different from, um, I think, how cortisol is typically analyzed. 
And what we found was really interesting. What we found in these moms were two robust trajectories. Um, and I apologize, this, this got cut off, but obviously you can see that there's two groups. Um, as you know, cortisol usually goes up like this in the morning. There's that nice morning rise, peaks, falls down, and, and, and goes down throughout the course of the day. So what we see here is a very um, a more robust versus a more blunted um, cortisol trajectory. And what we found is that blunted um, cortisol pattern was about 62% of our sample. And they had lower levels at every time point than the more robust um, moms. And obviously, if you're familiar with the stress literature, if you look at chronicity of stress, that's often associated with a blunting of diurnal cortisol. So we then looked to, um, to say, well, what qualities and characteristics of the moms map onto these trajectories that we've identified? And um, what we found is that the blunted trajectory had moms who had higher self-report levels of parent stress. They had lower mm. mindfulness scores, and I'll say more about that in just a minute. Lower um, health self ratings. They endorsed lower meaning or purpose in life. And close to 90% in this trajectory were indeed mothers of children on the autism spectrum. If we look across trajectory types, what we found is that moms who didn't show that nice morning rise and then decline, um, who had a blunted cortisol awakening response, um, they generally had lower BMIs, so they were thinner. Um, they had more eating disorders and also a proneness to irritable bowel, irritable bowel syndrome. And in terms of evening activities, for moms who had an, an upward tick in cortisol instead of the usual nice decline, um, those moms, about half of them, um, were generally older. They had higher Beck anxiety scores, higher Beck depression scores, and they were also less mindful. So really, really interesting and in my mind, alarming findings about the impact of chronic, the chronic stress of raising a child with a developmental disability on the health and well-being of the family system. And I, I found this a really, for me, a real turning point in how I, how I conduct my research. Because on the one hand, I could say, great, you know, I've got a nice descriptive study here, and it, we're in the process now of submitting it, but dang, I want to stop describing and start doing something about this high stress. We've been describing it for a long time. We know it's there. Let's do something about it. And the other thing that um, really sort of has me wondering is that when we think about the broader environment of where children with disabilities are growing up, they are essentially growing up in a very stressed family environment. And I don't think we have a very good understanding about what that means for the trajectory of children with different types of developmental disabilities. We have a good sense about what raising pups in an impoverished or stressed cage is, who are separated from their mother, who are deprived from stimulation. We know a lot about Romanian war orphans. What we really don't have a good sense of for this population is what's it like to grow up in a household if you have autism or Williams syndrome, and it's a very stressed system. We don't really have a good sense of that, and I think that that's a question that we really need to answer when we think about what a phenotype is. So um, I really wanted to move from describing stress and its negative effects to treatments that reduce stress and enhance well-being in this very at-risk group. And I, for the outcome, what I wanted to do was look at a wider profile of biomarkers, as well as other indices of health and mental health, um, and really think more about healthy adult development, okay, independent of raising a child. But what does it mean to be an adult in today's world? So what I did um, was I looked at the literature. And for those of you um, that are familiar with mindfulness, this is going to seem very elementary, but um, mindfulness is the state of being attentive to and aware of the present moment um, in a very deliberate way. Mindfulness-based stress reduction is a, an evidence-based um, intervention that is widely used in medical settings to reduce stress associated with 
um, many, many medical diseases, from cancer to diabetes to um, surgery prep. And it also has demonstrated um, efficacy in treating psychiatric disorders. So I thought, aha, well, here's, here's a proven package that can reduce stress in these populations. Let's, I wonder if it would work in parents as well. So I, um, the other thing I was interested in is thinking about, okay, let's reduce stress, but let's also think of a way to promote adult development. And how, what, what are some models for doing that? How can we think about that? And one of the things that the parents I work with um, found helpful is to say, you know, we need to move beyond these feelings of grief and guilt and suffering and I feel so alone. And so what I did is um, took a, a course on something called positive psychology. And what I learned, this is called Character Strengths and Virtues. It's by uh, Chris Peterson and Martin Seligman who are often coined the, the grandfathers, if you will, of the positive psychology um, movement. And this book is often called the UnDSM because it's not about pathology, it's about strengths and virtues. And these are some of the, the topics and issues that we've been exploring and the parents have been working with. So how does your experience as a parent and as adult and as a woman or a, or a man, um, how can we sort of reduce that and enhance some of these other things in terms of forgiveness and gratitude and hope, appreciation of beauty, kindness and loving, persistence, integrity, curiosity, social intelligence, and so on. And many families say that because of raising their child with a disability, they feel like they have many more of those things, which to me is a very interesting, very interesting idea. So we're now in the midst of a randomized clinical trial where we, compa we, we are comparing um, two treatment arms, one that we're calling positive parenting. We developed a curriculum based on many of the principles that I just shared with you. Um, and the other treatment arm is mindfulness-based stress reduction. It's a six-week um, intervention with three booster sessions over six months. This was a challenge grant I received um, through ERA funding. And as you recall, part of the ERA initiative is hire people. So I hired unemployed um, parents of kids with disabilities trained them in the curriculum, and they are the ones that are delivering this intervention. Um, so it's parent-to-parent, well-trained, well-supervised parents in, in two treatment arms, and data collection are ongoing. I'm really excited to, to see how this unfolds. And I just wanted to make a special note about um, military families. We've had some really interesting experiences at Fort Campbell, which is um, both in Tennessee and in Kentucky, and really sort of dealing with extraordinarily high levels of stress in those families. So you can imagine having two or three kids on the spectrum plus having a husband or a wife deployed for two of the last three years. So it's a really a magnitude of difference in terms of what we're seeing there. So in brief, you know, I, I think in many ways it really might be time to move on or at least think about going down that road less traveled. Because I had a, a grad student go back and actually look at the literature over the last 40 years that looked at measures of parental stress. And would you believe it hasn't gone down at all? If anything, it's gone up a bit, okay? Using the same measures. So there hasn't, despite our best efforts in the field, parents are just as stressed now as they were 40 years ago. So what we're doing really doesn't seem to be working that well for them. Um, yes, we can provide respite, um, and respite isn't a break for them to go shopping or the movies, but it's not really providing them with skills to help with stress. Yes, we can indeed provide them with information about their child's condition, tips for um, you know, helping their kids stay on target, advocacy, and these are necessary tools, but they're not sufficient. And this whole idea, I think, of parents being trained as at-home helpers or therapists, so especially for young children, parents are taught um, meaningful ways that they can better um, foster their child's development. You know, language skills, milieu therapy, play skills, um, you know, getting on the floor and, and playing and engaging. And if you do this, you'll increase requesting behavior and language. And so, um, you know, practice walking, going up and down stairs. So parents are really quite 
they're being relied upon in the child's treatment plan. So what we're finding, though, that's great for the kid, but sometimes that creates more stress for parents and moms who are trying to navigate providing their kid with all of this great stuff and juggling the other kids in the family and a husband and a, and a job. So it, cre it, it may backfire sometimes and inadvertently create more stress when we're trying to reduce it. So um, I think the other road that I'm traveling now with families is to flip the targeted intervention. In our randomized clinical trial, we're gathering information about the child and their age and level of functioning and diagnosis, but we're not doing anything with them. We're not intervening with the kid at all. We're not providing any tips about how to play with your kid. They have that already. They have that in abundance. We are just flipping the target of intervention and saying we're, tr we're, we're reducing parental stress, we're pr enhancing um, in positive ways how they think about their development as adults, and my hope is that at the end of the day, There'll be um, less health and mental health problems, um, less health care burden for them and for our community, and that there will be a ripple effect in the family. So, and to the extent that the, the moms and dads and siblings are doing language intervention and play intervention, perhaps in a less stressed family system, some of those interventions will have increased efficacy. It's like the old saying, if mama ain't happy, ain't no one happy. So I think that this is sort of flipping it a bit and, and testing a new way of trying to intervene in the system that has very little to do with the child and a lot more to do with moms and dads. So um, with that, what I'd like to do um, is segue into talking about individuals and phenotypes. So I think, again, as a clinician, and I know many of you are clinicians, um, the goal that we have in terms of the usual role where we think about phenotypes is to reduce distress, to reduce suffering, um, reduce psychiatric symptoms and poor social outcomes, perhaps improve cognition, improve social functioning. And to do that, we need to better understand the deficits that people are presenting with, their maladaptive behaviors, their psychiatric disorders, the service systems that are supporting them or not, um, and also the underlying um, genes and neurobiology interventions and policies. So we need to understand all of those things um, in, in order to effectively intervene. Um, the less traveled road is to do all of those things. Right? Those things shouldn't go away in terms of reducing suffering and distress. But another road is to also thinking about enhancing and promoting well-being and happiness and healthy outcomes. And to do that, we need to examine strengths and positive internal states happiness, engagement, purpose, achievement, meaning, and service systems that might be structured to promote those things in individuals and their families, and what the underlying genetics and neurobiology might be of some of these positive states. Um, and I'll have more to say about that at the end of the talk as well. So let's talk about this for a minute, because this is a hard, I mean, I'm a data-driven psychologist and you know, it's really kind of hard for me to, to think about these things because initially, especially when I took the class, it felt kind of squishy, and I like my data. So um, let's walk through some, some issues here. If we think about symptom reduction, so much of the work I've been doing in prader willi syndrome is how can we understand their obsessive compulsive behaviors and their hyperphagia in an effort to reduce those symptoms, to um, relieve uh, distress and suffering, um, and to help persons become less disruptive, self-injurious, anxious, and depressed, and to reduce their behavior by a certain magnitude. So IEPs are famous for this. You know, Johnny will not hit 20% less of the time or whatever, however it's structured. But this is the bread and butter of IEPs in terms of reducing that and reduce, increasing that by whatever percent the team um, feels is important. But is that all there is to life? Isn't there something else here? You know, I think there's a lot more to life than saying on the Beck Depression, great, you've gone from a 15 to a 7. Awesome. Job done. Have a great life. See you later. Um, or in the IEP, we've reduced that problem behavior by 
Excellent. Job well done. That's it? Isn't there more? Do we really want to define mental health as being simply less depressed or showing few behavior problems? Isn't there more than that? And I think that there truly is. And there truly is when we think about all of us in this room. And I think there truly is when we think about the families that we are passionate about serving. So when we think about engagements and strengths in people that have disabilities, I think there has been what I would call an historical nod to abilities and strengths. So there's a movement now, you may have heard it, um, you know, we're all about abilities, not disabilities. Dump the dis is another campaign, like get rid of the dis, it's about ability. Um, and in some of the work I've done, I know others have done, we've talked about profiles of strength and weakness and adaptive functioning or cognitive functioning. There's been this whole idea that we have to understand the whole person with a disability, not just their cognition, not just their underlying neurobiology, but how those things come together in a whole individual. And I think all of those things are just wonderful concepts. But I think for really going down a road in a meaningful way, you need bigger anchor points. And for me, I learned a great deal, again, from um, colleagues in positive psychology who were talking about some very interesting ideas that I thought, you know, these really seem to apply to what I'm looking for here. So in positive, and this is a rare moment of my children being very positive with, with one another. Um, so in positive psychology, it really sort of flips how we think about things. And the tenet here is that psychology, both as a research enterprise and a clinical enterprise, needs to be as concerned with strength as it is with weakness, be as interested in, in building the best things in life as in repairing the worst, be as concerned with making the lives of people fulfilling as with healing pathology, and also, in addition to alleviating distress, creating enhancements to well-being. That's a pretty tall order. So over the years, um, people have sort of come up with different ways of understanding and categorizing that. <coughs> Dr. Seligman has one way. It's certainly not the only way. He talks about um, positive emotions, about the past, the present, and the future. He talks about engagement, using your strengths and virtues to, to increase meaning and flow in your life. And I'll say more about flow in a minute. And also using strengths and virtues to not only find meaning for you, but to give back to the community, to find something to connect with that's bigger than you. And just by virtue of the fact that you are in this room and you're in the field that you're in means that you're doing this thing all the time. But there's no reason why people with disabilities can't be doing that, too, in terms of giving back in ways that are bigger than them. So um, I'm not sure if any of you have read this book yet. I read a little bit of it on the plane coming out. But Dr. Seligman has a new book out called Flourishing, or Flourish, I believe. And in, I haven't read this book yet. I've just read the first few pages. But in that, again, he's sort of talking about things that are reminiscent of his earlier books and, and research in the area about the need for work and enhancement of positive emotions, um, esteem and optimism, as well as engagement, interest and flow, positive relationships, meaning and purpose, achievement, and using one's strengths and virtues in the service of promoting all of these. And if one can do that, so the theory goes, then you are a flourishing person living in a flourishing community and a flourishing society. Um, I'll have to finish the book and see how I really feel about that. So um, in going down this positive road less traveled by, one of the things that um, we've been doing more actively in the research program that, uh, that I direct is really looking at neurocognitive strengths and talents, as well as character strengths and virtues, P obviously positive outcomes for families and care providers, and also interventions that enhance well-being not only in families, but also in individuals with different types of disabilities. And we do this through um, some of our summer camp programs. Uh, we do it through a mixture of Vanderbilt undergraduate students working through the Best Buddies program with adults with disabilities who go off together on alternative spring break and do service um, all across the country. Um, Mindfulness-based stress reduction in individuals that have disabilities and obviously our, um, the parent stress reduction program that I just mentioned to you. And as I said earlier, for me, this has been a hard road to think about going down. You know, the work that we do and the work that I've done traditionally 
in genomic syndromes has really focused on urgent, life-threatening problems that, are, that bring people in for consultation to see you. They don't come in and say, hey, Robin, Randy, hey, things are going really well. They come in and say, I'm really worried about something. I'm, I need some help with this. And you know, the conditions that we all deal with are, are fairly significant. So in Prader-Willi syndrome, there are some very clinically urgent, life-threatening, stressful, and hard-to-manage issues. Um, compulsivity and life, literally life-threatening hyperphagia. In Williams syndrome, a level of social disinhibition that on the one hand is charming, but on the other hand leads to um, just painful stories about exploitation and abuse. And these are real things that we need to strive to address and reduce. Um, so, you know, part of me thought, well, if I start talking about this positive stuff, people are going to think that, you know, what about this, these really hard things? And those hard things don't go away. We need both roads to come together in the service of understanding these very complex disorders that, that we're involved with. So again, um, we need a meeting of the roads to understand the complexities in, in intellectual and developmental disabilities, to look at both problems and strengths. And the complexities that come from, I think, a broader appreciation of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And here the idea is um, not so much, it's part of the equation to say that we provide people with services, that we, that we give them services as part of our, part of your center, part of my center. We, we do that. Um, but that's, that's only half of it. Okay? And one of the words that I hate in our field today is consumer because consumer implies taking things in. I hate it in Prader-Willi syndrome because it implies eating all the time. I hate the word consumer um, because it doesn't imply giving back. It doesn't imply a reciprocity that I think undermines the abilities and how we think about people and the capabilities of people with disabilities. So part of this equation is how do people that we work with, how do they enrich our lives? How do they contribute to our lives our research, our work, our value system, our culture, and what do they teach us and how do we engage with them uh, in ways that suggest that you know, there's value, social value added that we are very glad is happening. And that's a different shift in terms of how we think about providing service to consumers that take in versus, great, you can take this service in, now let's talk about how you're going to be engaged and give back and become um, sort of uh, all of these things for the, that the rest of us do. And some anchor points that I've discovered as ways of doing that in the syndromes I work with um, are looking not only at the significant challenges in Prader-Willi syndrome, but also some really curious and interesting areas of strength that I'm still literally quite puzzled about. Um, and also in Williams syndrome, again, looking at some of their significant challenges along with um, a very distinct personality profile and a profound interest in music, which I will share with you in just a minute. Many of you in this room know a lot about Prader-Willi syndrome, but for those of you that are less familiar, here's a thumbnail sketch. It affects about one in 15,000 live births. When babies with Prader-Willi syndrome are born, they're very floppy, hypotonic, they often require um, gavage and other feeding techniques because of a poor suck. There can be a, a period of failure to thrive. And many of the, um, the challenges that we see in Prader-Willi syndrome relate to uh, dysfunction in the hypothalamus that I, I venture to say has yet to be defined. And I had the pleasure a number of years ago of hearing um, Dr. Prader uh, speak at an international meeting. and. He stood up and he said to the room, okay, I said 50 some odd years ago that there was something in this syndrome, there's something wrong with the hypothalamus. And he chided the group. He said, and now you're telling me all these years later with all the tools and techniques we have, you can't tell me what's wrong with the hypothalamus? I guessed this a number of years ago. Get to work on this. Um, and I think, he, I think he had a point. So we know the, you know, the aberrant satiety um, that we see beginning anywhere between four and eight years of age, the hyperphagia, <coughs> increased risks of obesity, deficient growth hormone secretion, short stature, incomplete sexual development, aberrant body temperature regulation, sleep disturbances, all of these 
smack of difficulties with regulation of hypothalamus. Um, the genetics of prader willi syndrome are fascinating and complicated. Jean and I had a great discussion just before this talk about the work that she's doing, and um, it's just fascinating. So prader willi syndrome is caused in most cases by about 70% 70, 70 of cases by a paternal deletion in um, this chromosome 15Q11 uh, to Q13 region. But there is breakpoint one, breakpoint three. So type one deletions are bigger. Okay, they go from here to here. Type two deletions go from here to here. So, and there are four non-imprinted genes that are deleted, therefore, in type one cases, but not type two. Most of the remaining 25% of people with prader willi syndrome have maternal uniparental disomy. And what that means is that instead of getting one chromosome 15 from mother and one from dad, both come from mother. About 5% have translocations or imprinting center mutations. And very exciting to all of us, including um, Janine, is uh, an increased suspicion and um, role for these SNOW RNAs um, in the um, behavioral and developmental phenotype of prader willi syndrome. So it is a very rich and complicated area. Many of you know that in an opposite um, imprinting pattern with paternal UPD or maternal deletion, that leads to Angelman syndrome in a vastly different phenotype, um, which is equally, equally as interesting. So in terms of um, you know, the failure to thrive, hypotonio, um, growth hormone replacement therapy is now considered best care uh, in prader willi syndrome, and many infants and babies are now being given growth hormone um, with good effects in terms of their muscle tone, linear growth, uh, facial expression, um, although the cognitive or developmental um, effects of that treatment remain yet to be described. I have spent many years studying repetitive and compulsive behaviors in prader willi syndrome. I've been impressed by the high levels of these repetitive comp compulsive behaviors and hoarding compared to others with disabilities, compared to patients with obsessive compulsive disorder, compared to people with autism spectrum disorder. Um, what makes them quite unique in my mind is they have an unbelievable um, hoarding behavior uh, which really stands out even relative to all those other groups I just mentioned. Um, and they also have very persistent skin picking, which can be at, lead to very significant medical complications and decisions about whether or not to have surgery based on skin picking behavior because kids go in and they pick at their lesions and their surgery site. So it's a very, it can be a quite um, serious issue. People with maternal uniparental disomy, um, the literature suggests are more prone to autism, about 38 to 40% may be on the spectrum. Um, they are also quite prone to severe psychiatric illness with close to 100% having some kind of severe psychiatric illness onset in youth or young adulthood. Typically, it's psychosis. Depending on what country you come from or what nosology you use, it's called a zillion different things, and that's part of the problem here. We don't really have a good handle on what the symptoms are. And, and the work I'm doing going forward, we're really kind of teasing apart what we mean when we talk about psychosis or psychiatric illness or depression or lability um, in this population. So um, you know, is it inevitable? In this group, it may be. I've got colleagues that I adore in the UK who are saying, let's give everyone with maternal UPD a little antipsychotic when they turn 13 and prevent the onset of psychosis, keep them going on their developmental trajectories. And it's an idea certainly worth considering, but I don't think we're there yet, particularly considering the fact that weight gain is often a side effect of many of those antipsychotic um, agents. Um, and I think we don't really know a lot yet in terms of what overexpression of genes we're talking about in 15Q to the, in that region in terms of looking at increased risks of um, either psychosis or of autism, but there are certainly some exciting um, candidates on the horizon. So one of the things that um, the prader willi research community has been doing, myself included, is thinking about 
these sort of type 1 versus type 2 deletions. We know a lot about, we know a relative amount about um, UPD, but there's been a lot of excitement thinking about, well, if you have a big deletion or you have a smaller deletion, how does that impact behavior and development? And there's been a, some studies, um, uh, Butler and Hartley and others, that have suggested that those with type 1 deletions have more compulsions, lower adaptive behavior skills, lower math and reading achievement. Um, we have found no consistent differences between the two using a relatively large sample, as have others, both here and abroad. You know, these studies, I think, all suffer from having using different age groups, small sample size. And what we are finding, though, is that um, instead of using a cross-sectional approach where you have a cohort here and a cohort there and you compare them, <clears throat> where we are seeing differences emerge is across development and over time. So this slide is just a, an example of what we see uh, in, um, when we look over time, these are cross-sectional, but I'll show you longitudinal in a minute. These are externalizing behavior problems, and this is age, uh, and starting at 10, going up to about 40 or 50. And, and you can see in type 1 cases, it's going down. Type 2 cases, relatively stable. Uh, UPD, yeah, stable or maybe a tad up. We see this trajectory in adaptive behavior, IQ scores, internalizing problems, although that's somewhat different in the UPD cases. So there's something going on perhaps over time. And um, longitudinally, just looking at IQ, these are 45 individuals that were tested two years apart, roughly in the same age group. And again, as a prototype, we looked at IQ scores, and you'll see type 1 individuals are going down over a two-year period from 67 to 52 type 2 from 73 to 68, which is not significant. And those with um, UPD are actually going up, They're going up a great deal, even in the face of significant psychopathology. They're getting better, and where they're getting better is in an area of weakness for them and their visual spatial skills. So they're just getting a lot better. And why that is the case, I have no idea. So um, for the type 1 folks, we do see a decline in IQ adaptive skills and also problem behaviors, compulsive behaviors, and hyperphagia. We also see an increase in withdrawal and passivity. It's almost as if for those with type 1 deletions over time, the oomph is being knocked out of their Prader Willi, um, which is a relief to the parents. But what's concerning here is that we're also seeing increased passivity and withdrawal. So, um, that trajectory feels a little bit reminiscent to me in terms of a trajectory that people in this room are very familiar with, and that is fragile X syndrome and looking at full mutation males. And when I pointed that similarity out in the discussion section of my paper, the reviewer said, uh-uh, take it out. That's way too speculative. You don't know that for sure. And I, I said, okay. But it's an interesting, very interesting idea. And if you think about um, those with type 1 deletions who don't have those for non-imprinted genes, one of them happens to be a gene that people in this room are very interested in, called SIFIP. And um, I'm working with uh, um, Dr. Tasson to look at um, SIFIP expression in people with Prader-Willi syndrome who have type 1 versus type 2 deletions versus UPD. And um, I think the data thus far, as we would expect, with lower expression in those with um, type 1. And you know, it's just interesting to me, if we think about this, um, this SIFIP, is this a second hit for Prader-Willi syndrome? So they don't, they don't have a SIFIP. And they don't have one of their two SIFIPs. Okay? Over time, then, is, do we see um, a consequence of that that is not immediate, but that somehow builds over time? And I think that's an open question and one that I'm looking forward to, to answering. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention very quickly is that um, hyperphagia is of keen, keen um, interest not only to the families that deal with diets, food restrictions, and locking cabinets every day of their life, but also because Prader-Willi syndrome is increasingly framed as a model syndrome for obesity and the obesity epidemic in the general population. Um, I think there are lots of differences between Tennessee obesity 
or Tennessee cuisine obesity, as we call it, and prader willi syndrome. But that said, certainly in the grants that we write, it's, all, it's always helpful to say you have a model of something, correct? And I think here, in earnest, um, we can learn a lot about human obesity from people that have prader willi syndrome. Um, we have recently developed a questionnaire, because when you think about it, how do you measure something as complicated as hyperphagia? Um, we have not, the, the gold standard for measuring hyperphagia in the field is called the sandwich plate test. And essentially what that means is you give people sandwich quarters on a plate and you count how many sandwich quarters they eat. It's very high tech um, and it, people have had great success using it in the UK. Um, I have a colleague who used it in Florida. I cannot get it past the IRB in any institution I have been at. And um, quite frankly, I think I share their reservation. So the findings are as you would expect. People with prader willi syndrome eat you know, 63 sandwich quarters compared to controls that eat four. Okay? So is that a measure of hyperphagia? Probably yes, it's a great one, but there are other measures that may not put people um, at risk. And we developed this questionnaire really to use um, in future clinical trials with targets that are coming, we hope, online soon um, that target the hyperphagia that we see in, in prader willi syndrome. We're also using it in our research to look at phenotypic effects of just in general and also of other serotonin altering genes. And we just have a paper out now looking at tryptophan hydroxylase 2, which is the rate limiting enzyme in the biosynthesis biosynthesis of serotonin in the brain, looking at the GT polymorphism, and it turns out that people with prader willi syndrome who have that polymorphism have more hyperphagia um, and an earlier age of onset of hyperphagia. So that's a very interesting finding to, to all of us. So let's talk a little bit about the road less traveled by in prader willi syndrome. Um, and for me, there are two areas that are really interesting and not well traveled. One is something I haven't been able to really quantify well. And it has to do with a nurturant streak that we see in many individuals, a kindness and a, a lovingness that doesn't really reflect empathy. It reflects wanting to take care of physically another being or another entity. So it's not so much that they want to um, be highly empathic, they don't feel pain when the other thing is in pain perhaps, but they want to physically take care of babies and pets. And we see it again and again and again in ways that are very striking. People that come into our program that are kind of walking slow like this and they see a cat across the way, they dart over to, to try to engage the cat. Um, I, can, you know, I have many, many stories that, that depict this high need to in, be involved in the physical mechanics of caring for others, bathing, stroking, brushing, feeding pets or, or people. Um, very strong, for lack of a better word, nurturance streak. And might that be related to aberrant oxytocin in prader willi syndrome? That's a question that we're, we're now looking at. We do know from post-mortem studies conducted a number of years ago that there are decreased oxytocin secreting neurons in the PVN um, in prader willi syndrome, which may be implicated in aberrant satiety. And of course, that leads to the idea, well, gee, what happens if we give people oxytocin internasally? What happens to their hyperphagia? And a number of sites are now um, testing that hypothesis. But for me, in addition to the hyperphagia, it's really interesting thinking about how that might relate to a finding that I have, it, I have yet to be able to really quantify. In contrast, we've done a great job quantifying um, this unusual skill or interest in jigsaw puzzles and word search puzzles that we have seen in prader willi syndrome. And I decided to study this because um, Clinically, we observed that people would come into the clinic with their backpack packed just the right way, everything lined up the way it should in their backpack, um, and they would pull out their puzzle boxes and sit and do jigsaw puzzles. And, well, that's very interesting. Um, and parents would often say, well, yeah, he loves puzzles, or she loves puzzles, does them all the time. So I thought, okay, let's do another high-tech study here. Let's take cardboard um, jigsaw puzzles uh, and see how many puzzle pieces that people can put together in a three-minute period and just count them. So very high-tech. 
And what we found is that compared to um, Prader-Willi syndrome, we looked at people that had intellectual disabilities and also a typically developing group matched on age. What we found was pretty amazing. Um, people with Prader-Willi syndrome just knocked the top off of puzzles on average. So an average of 32 pieces compared to three or four in the mixed group. And they did better than typically developing AI mental age matches. Okay? So they are just whizzes. Um, they have a distinct strategy. They don't use the picture on the box. They start with the borders first. And unlike what I do when I solve a puzzle, which is to press my thumb into thinking it has to go in there, um, they don't force the pieces together. So I thought I would show you a very brief video clip of a young man named Richard that I worked with at UCLA um, who likes puzzles. Get the idea? So he's doing pretty well, huh? What, what did you notice? The borders, the borders yeah. Uh, did he make many errors? He never, he never looked at the picture. Didn't rotate the piece. He just went boom, boom, and plucked it in right where he didn't rotate the piece. He just knew exactly where it went. I, I can't do that. Um, he can, and, and uh, it's pretty amazing. So what is it about puzzles? Um, we have gone hog wild with a graduate student looking at some of these issues. We've done mental rotations, spatial perception, lo spatial localization studies. We've played with the puzzles. We've looked at blank puzzles, non-interlocking, you know, jigsaw with faces. No matter how we slice it, um, those with Prader-Willi syndrome don't do as well on those standardized tests of visual spatial function. And they do better on jigsaw puzzles, and it's jigsaw puzzles only. Okay? Um, we noticed as well that they rely predominantly on shape, less on visual cues, um, and that's flipped in typically developing kids. They rely more on visual cues than they do on shape. And um, what this means, how does it relate to subtypes, we don't know yet. Um, how does it relate with people with autism who are also rumored to be great at jigsaw puzzles, we don't know yet. Should we exploit the skill as parents? You know, really, this is a great skill. Should we bring it to the IEP and cut all their homework assignments into puzzles and use it as a reinforcer? Should we use it for broader gain? And we could certainly do that. But having sat with many people like Richard doing puzzles, I think that what, what happens with Richard is that, and others is that they are experiencing flow when they do their puzzles. And flow is that pop psychology term that I cr absolutely cringe to this day to say, but it has a growing neuroscience basis. And flow are those moments that we hopefully all have in our life when we're so at one with a task or an activity, so engaged with it that we lose sense of time, our sense of self drops away, um, we get immediate uh, sort of clear feedback, it's deep effortless involvement, time stops, it could be scrapbooking, analyzing data, talking with someone. Um, and the more flow that we have, the, um, the less depressed we are, and that's a pretty robust finding. 
So the meaning of the roads in Prader-Willi syndrome, you know, I think we need to look at these things more carefully. To me, they're just as fascinating as compulsivity um, and behavior problems and psychosis. Um, so another example of a road less traveled by is in Williams syndrome. And Williams syndrome is an equally as fascinating condition as Prader-Willi syndrome and Fragile X syndrome and all the other syndromes. Um, it involves a deletion of about 20 or so, 23 genes on 7Q11, seven, one of the chromosome sevens, leads to a very distinctive cognitive linguistic phenotype, which many of you are familiar with, visual spatial um, deficits and weaknesses and marked strengths in expressive vocabulary and expressive language, marked sociability, high recall of faces, very good facial recognition, um, very interested in other, very empathic, um, highly engaging their mirror neuron when they're doing various tasks. Um, they also have very high generalized anxiety and phobias, and this is the research that our group has done as well as others, um, looking at high rates of phobias about all kinds of things, generalized anxiety disorder, but very low social anxiety, no social anxiety, in fact. We want them to have a little social anxiety and they don't have it. So they have sort of kind of a worry wart, this is my new DSM category here, um, sort of persona, um, but with no social anxiety. And for that reason, they are a fascinating group to try to understand and to study. Another really interesting reason why they are fascinating to study is because they have, many individuals have unusual auditory processing, um, which leads to an interest in music, musicality, and a real love of music, if not frank, musical talent. And this is a picture of our campers. We have a um, annual summer music camp for young adults with Williams syndrome, and also um, in the last two years with autism spectrum disorder. And here they are posing around the piano. So clearly, um, we, you know, from Aristotle and the ancient Greeks to, to today, we know that music reduces anxiety um, and promotes well-being, and that's increasingly documented in very nicely controlled studies in the field of music therapy, which historically hasn't been known for doing that, but which I have to admit is really doing a great job using modern day tools to try to quantify um, these phenomena. We know that in Williams syndrome, compared to others, people, others with and without developmental disabilities, they have increased engagement with music and attraction to music. They, they don't love music, they absolutely positively love it. Um, their affective response is quite um, high. They have relative strengths in pitch and rhythm. There's a suggestion of increased perfect pitch in this population, but that paper has some issues with it. I'm not 100% sure that we're there yet in terms of saying that. But here, as with puzzles in Prader-Willi syndrome, there's sort of a buzz. You know, is this hype? Is this just a few cases? Is this real? Is this just something wished for? Certainly in the studies that we've done, there does seem to be something um, musical about this population. Um, However, I think we have very little data on the, the mechanisms or correlates of musicality. We are, during that one week of music camp, um, in addition to having a great time with campers, they come, they write a song with local songwriters in Nashville, which is Music City, USA. Um, they produce their song in a recording studio and they sing on the stage of the Grand Ole Opry. So it's a wonderful experience for them. And we run around collecting data the whole week. Um, we're doing imaging studies, we're looking at um, music and auditory processing, as well as looking at their anxiety and treatment um, interventions for anxiety. So it is a really win-win fun situation, and um, this past uh, spring, we had a great moment in Kennedy Center camp, in Kennedy Center history, when our campers were selected to be on the ACM, award show, the Country Music Award. And I don't know if any of you saw that, but there were close to 17 million viewers that our campers were performing in front of with Darius Rucker. And they sang the song that they wrote with Brett James and Chris Young, who were very leading songwriters in Nashville. I'm learning a lot about country music these days. 
Um, and what I'd like to do is share with you their performance, as a, I thought it would be a very fun way to end, um, end the talk. So what is it about these campers that makes people cry, that reaches them? How does their music um, facilitate that? And you know, how can we think in new ways about understanding what these guys bring to the equation, not just how we serve or service them? So they brought gifts that we're still getting emails from people that have seen this and, and want to give $5. We would like to add a, few, add a few zeros to that, but um, at any rate, I had a few other slides, but I think it's, um, that's a great way to stop and say thank you so very much for your attention. Are there anything that you can correlate between the mother's stress and the uh, function of the child? Not yet. Markers? We hope that we can because we'll have longitudinal data. There's some preliminary data that suggests that if you do produce, um, and it was a case series, I think, of five or six moms that had kids on the spectrum that just treated them, no, t intervened with the mothers, and then what they reported, and it wasn't measured, unfortunately, but what the moms reported is that their kids had fewer behavior problems. Is that because the kid actually had fewer behavior problems? Is that because the mom is less stressed? and perceives fewer problems? Is it that that cycle is interrupted where stress leads to stress leads to problems leads to, you know? Um, I don't know from based on that case series. I'm hoping that when we finish our trial that I'll be able to get a better handle on that because we'll have to, um, data over time that tracks how moms are doing and how the kiddo is doing. Yeah. What's your guess? Well, as you say, when mother's happy, everybody's happy. Yeah, right, right, right. Agreed. <laughs> yeah, so I, I love your talk. I, um, never uh, Quite an amazing integration of both, you know, science and human values. I don't know what to call it, but an amazingly eclectic, uh, integrative combination. My question is a specific one about the, um, the puzzle finding. I mm -hmm. find that pretty interesting, and, and apparently you don't find that strength in, for example, Legos, which seems very similar. No. Yeah, so I was wondering, um, I think it's called object assembly. It's one of the subtests mm -hmm. on the WISC-3. Yep. I don't, unfortunately, I don't think it's in the WISC-4. People must have gobs of data across not just will all different sorts of disorders. Yep. Have you looked? Have have you found this in in uh, object assembly as well? We've looked at object assembly. Absolutely, that was in an earlier study, and we com we also looked at block design. Um, we looked at the VMI, which is a written visual motor integration task. We looked at um, uh, spatial localization. We looked at rotating monkeys. We gave a full battery, and they did do better um, on the. Uh, um, the WISC subtest, the um, puzzle, <laughs> whatever. Object Thank you, object assembly. They did do better on that, but they didn't do better on any of the other, none of the other, none of the other indices, none. And I was looking for a little strength, like, you know, just puzzles. And I thought, okay, well, this is just a practice <laughs> effect, right? Maybe they're just doing it all the time. Um, but when we looked at age as a correlate, there's a modest reasonable correlation between age and number of pieces that one puts together. But I wasn't blown away by it. And I think there is clearly a practice effect. The more you practice with something, the better you are at doing it. But some of our best puzzlers were five, six, and 10 years old. So that would suggest that there's, there's some affinity, some attraction um, for puzzle pieces. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I just am increasingly baffled. The other interesting thing is that I wonder if it's, initially I thought it would be spatial locating patterns in space because we also have a group that come in um, with word find books, you know, the word find books that you get at the supermarket and they love them, love them, love them. Even people that don't read like doing word find books. So is it that they're recognizing a series of letters or a pattern? It, it just, um, is mind-boggling to me that people cannot be fluent readers and love to do word fine. I loved your talk as well. Um, I was wondering, and I don't have this completely well thought out, but okay. I have a it's... gut feeling that could there be a connection between the compulsivity mm -hmm. and the puzzle ability? And what I'm kind of thinking of is like, 
this ability to kind of just keep working at something and going and almost is reminiscent of skin picking in a way mm -hmm. where you just it's a visual thing and you just want to keep working at it over and over and you kind of have to be compulsive a little bit I think mm -hmm. to be successful at a mm -hmm. jigsaw puzzle mm -hmm. uh, it's just a we looked at that because I thought yes this is a this is a reflection of needs for sameness getting things just right you, know, you like that nice satisfying click when you get yeah. the piece in um, that makes intuitive sense the correlations didn't come out I, it, I wanted them to, <laughs> but they didn't. But it's, it doesn't, just because the correlations didn't come out doesn't mean that there's still not something there that's worth pursuing. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, are, are there any studies um, that you've done with uh, Prater Willen and maybe with autism about uh, when the student, when the female uh, starts having their, their period, mm -hmm. that you find different jumps, uh, intellectual jumps, or um, emotional uh, growth uh, mm -hmm. with the hormonal? Well, I think that um, it's a, studies. I haven't, we're, we're looking at autism now as a comparison group to prader willi syndrome, but um, adolescent and pubertal development in prader willi syndrome is aberrant. So unless individuals receive um, hormone replacement therapy, sex hormone, like estrogen in the, in the, in the girls and testosterone in the boys, um, girls don't typically have menses and they have incomplete sexual development. So if they do have periods, it, they are scant and infrequent. Um, the lore used to be that people with prader willi syndrome were infertile or that women were infertile and they could not reproduce. It's now been proven, however, there are three people in, um, across the world that have prader willi syndrome and have reproduced. Typically, they have become pregnant when they are coming off of an SSRI. So there's some kind of change going on there that perhaps someone can explain to me. But um, so that said, I think that you know, there, there are clearly hormones, but there's this whole controversy in the, in the prader willi community. Do you replace hormones or not? Do you want to have a, if you've got an adolescent boy who's prone to disruptive behavior and temper tantrums, do you want to give him some testosterone to just juice some things up there, or do you want to just let it be? <laughs> so it's, there's sort of an ongoing controversy in the field, if you will. I was just curious, um, what kind of psychoses are you seeing with the kids with the UPD? What you said of? when they hit about the age of puberty, you're saying almost 100% have some kind of psychoses mm -hmm. develop. Like, what are you seeing with those kids? Well, that's the big question, because um, unfortunately, the studies to date just say they have um, a mixed bipolar psychotic affective disorder picture. And I, well, what on earth does that mean? So the, the challenge is that different countries and labs use different nosologies. And so I don't know what that means in terms of the DSM. And I don't know if the DSM is even helpful here. But what we've seen is um, distorted thinking, magical thinking, uh, auditory hallucinations, visual hallucinations, um, uh, from agit increased agitation, um, uh, periods of withdrawal, um, <coughs> and significant depression. It is the only time that I've seen people who otherwise are very interested in food not be interested in food. So for me, that's a, another red signal that, or signal that something is really awry. So they're very significant and, and quite glaring symptoms. They're not subtle. Okay, well, one more, wanna, one more. This woman's like oh. very patient. Right? <laughs> I just had a question: if for if Prater Willie, if they don't have menses or they have scant menses, did do they have enough cholesterol, uh, at least a level of one hundred and sixty, to even make the steroid hormones? In autism, the subset of people have hmm. not enough cholesterol, mm -hmm. um, and, and they have uh, nutrition, other nutritional deficiencies. Yeah, cholesterol seems surprisingly cholesterol seems to be okay in, in Prader-Willi syndrome. Um, thyroid seems to be okay. Um, sort of those sorts of functions do seem to be, be okay. Lower risk of cancers as well, so. Thank well, you thank very you. much, Elizabeth. Thank you. The UC Davis Mind Institute began in 1998 with a promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. 
Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, learning disabilities, and other brain disorders is helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please call or visit our website to find out more about current studies, our research team, and upcoming events.